Good morning, Rock Hill. We are excited to worship our risen Lord and Savior Jesus with you this morning. So we're going to begin with some music. I'm going to ask you to stand with us. everyone. It's great to see you guys at Rock Hill on a beautiful Sunday morning. Hope you guys are doing great. If you're new with us today, I just want to say welcome. I'm so glad that you chose to come check out Rock Hill today. I hope that you feel loved and welcomed and let us know if there's anything you need, any questions you have or any way that we can serve you. One thing I wanted to say is I know you guys prayed for us last week. So I'm the youth director here at Rock Hill and we had our very big, very amazing uh, youth conference last week, District Blitz. I know you guys prayed for us and I just wanna say that your prayers were answered. We had an awesome time. We had some incredible God conversations. Uh, the gospel was preached and we were just really blessed to hear that our church family was with us and praying for us. So thank you for that. Today at Rock Hill, we're continuing our series going through the book of John, and today we're going to learn and talk about how Jesus is the Lord of the wine. Sound interesting, right? It's going to be good. And our call to worship this morning is from Hebrews 12, 28 through 29. So let me read that, and then we'll pray together. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe. For our God is a consuming fire. Let's pray. Lord, we come here this morning. God, we come from so many different situations, circumstances, and places. But God, all together, we just want to say that we are grateful that we have received your kingdom that cannot be shaken through the blood of Jesus. God, thank you so much. Lord, I pray that everyone here 
would grow in their love for you this morning as we learn about the plan that you have and that you are the Lord of the wine. Thank you, God. In Jesus' name, amen. mercifully initiated covenant with us, but he has graciously kept it when we have failed. And so our response to this initiating covenantal love can be worship. Your love is devoted like a ring of solid gold, like a vow that is tested. Like a covenant of old, your love is enduring through the winter rain and beyond the horizon with mercy for today.
your children then you hear your children now you are the same god you are the same god you answer prayers back then and you will answer now you are the same god you are the same god you were providing declare that this morning that we need you God when we are truly honest about who we are what we bring to the table and when we rightly see who you are there's nothing we can say except that we need you we cannot save ourselves we cannot do enough good things or right things to be reconciled to a holy and perfect God and so we declare that we need you to do it for us. And we rejoice in the fact that you have. That through the blood of your son, you have brought us into your family. And we rejoice in that. And God, as we see in the story today where Jesus was needed for what might seem like a simple thing of helping a family avoid embarrassment and to allow the party to go on, God, it was much deeper than that. Jesus is needed to give us new hearts, to give us new lives, to give us peace, hope, a spot in your family. So God, may we not look at our neediness as a problem, but as a reason to look to you and to worship you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to take a really brief fellowship break where you can maybe find someone new and introduce yourself. And when Kyle comes up, please find your seats.
All right, if you can find your way back, that'd be awesome to your seats. We're going to be in John chapter 2 this morning. This is, uh, this passage I think is just an incredible picture of who Jesus is. Would you guys pray with me as we get going? I'm going to just give you a second. Why don't you pray and ask God to speak to you, and then in a few seconds I'll jump in. Lord, we're here this morning, and we, we need to hear from you. We trust that your word was written for us, preserved for us, so that today, in this moment, in Duluth, Minnesota, we could open it up and your spirit would speak to us and reveal more of who Jesus is to us. So I pray that that would happen. God, would you speak through me or in spite of me, but would you speak so that your people might see Jesus? It's in his name I pray. Amen. Have you ever really wanted to make a good first impression? Like maybe it was the moment that you were meeting your significant other's parents for the first time, and you're thinking, don't screw this up, right? Or maybe you have a job interview at a company that you really want to work for, and you get one chance to make a first impression, right? First impressions are important, but they're not everything. I mean, every rom-com that's ever been made is usually a bad first impression, followed by a whole story to see that, oh man, they're really actually great. I mean, this is how the Hallmark Channel exists. <laughs> but today we're going to read the story of Jesus' first miracle, or his first sign, his way of, of declaring to the world that I'm here, and there's something significant that's going on. It's a sign that points to something more than just the miracle in itself. And we get to learn a lot about who Jesus is by looking at this chance that he has to show himself to the world in a new way. And it happens in ways that we would probably not expect. Water into wine? Which actually makes us ask the question, what are the purpose of the miracles of Jesus? Why does he do them? Why does, why does John attach to the miracles of Jesus and call them a sign? It means that they're pointing to something deeper than they, them in and of themselves. See, a lot of people come to the conclusion that the miracles of Jesus are there to show us that he is God or that he has God's power. I mean, who could do things like this other than God himself superseding the natural laws that govern our world to do something extraordinary, to do something supernatural. But if you look at the miracles in and of themselves, some of them are actually not all that spectacular. Oh, they're miraculous. They take the power of God to do, but if, if Jesus was, was interested in simply demonstrating the raw power of God, of showing the world, hey, I am a force to be reckoned with here, he could have done some things that were more spectacular, right? I mean, he could have flown. That'd be pretty cool. He could have called down fire from heaven and incinerated something like the Roman army. That would have gained him quite a following. That would have made him the most popular man around, except in Rome. And even the most supernatural of his miracles over modern laws, like walking on water, why is it that he did that when only 12 people could see it? It's, it's when you start asking questions like this that you begin to realize that the miracles in and of themselves are not just to show that Jesus has the power of God, but also to reveal to us how God is going to use his power in a redemptive way to bring the kingdom. See, almost all of them have to do with God showing something or reversing the effects of the fall in some way, showing us that God is going to use his power in a redemptive, restorative way. And so here we have the story of Jesus doing the first miracle, the first sign pointing, revealing who he is to the world. And it's turning water into wine. Interesting. Would you have picked that? Would I have picked that? Probably not, but Jesus does. Let's read it together. John chapter 2, first 12 verses. On the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. 
Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Now there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, now draw out some and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. When the master of the feast tasted the water, now become wine, and did not know where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, everyone serves the good wine first. And when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. This, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee, and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. After this... He went down to Capernaum with his mother and his brothers and his disciples, and they stayed there for a few days. The primary character in the first few verses of this story is not actually Jesus. It's Mary, the mother of Jesus. The wedding and her involvement in it shows us that they must be either close family friends or relatives because Mary is deeply invested in this going well. Jesus and his newfound disciples are invited to this wedding. Now, weddings in those days were different than weddings are today. Uh, they were sometimes week-long events. It was the uniting of two families. It wasn't just a two to three hour after the wedding ceremony like dinner and maybe some dancing. It was a, a long feast where, where the groom and his family were responsible to plan and execute this party to show the bride and her family that she was indeed in good hands. In an honor-shame culture, to run out of wine and to have the party end a few days early would have meant something far more significant and shameful than it does today. The stigma of poor planning or limited resources could have followed this young couple the rest of their lives. And so Mary, noticing this, goes up to Jesus and says, they have no wine. Jesus' response to her is actually rather brush or stark. Woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. Why the coolness? Why the distance? To address his mother as woman, not Ima or mom? Is Jesus being disrespectful here? No, I don't think so. But he is creating a bit of what you would call maybe professional distance between he and his mother. He's saying, in essence, to her, you cannot make demands of me as the Messiah simply because you're my mom. You'll have to relate to me differently as well than you have up till this point. He says to her, what does this have to do with me? Why is this my problem? And then he says something really interesting. My hour has not yet come. Now, we're going to circle back to that statement in a little bit because it's such a significant statement in the Gospel of John. But suffice it to say, this is a technical phrase in John's Gospel that always means the hour of Jesus' death. In essence, what Jesus is saying in the middle of this wedding to his mom as they run out of wine is, what's that have to do with me? I'm not ready to die yet. Or what you're asking of me is going to put into motion certain events that will ultimately lead to my death. More on that in a bit, but I think Mary's response to that kind of cool, like, uh, what does this have to do with me, is amazing. Read in verse 5, his mother said to the servants, she hears him, and then she says to the servants, do whatever he tells you. What faith, right? Do whatever he tells you. Why, why does she do this? Well, she knows who he is. I mean, she, she had the angel visit her, right? She, she gave birth to a son after never having been with a man. She knows there's something different about Jesus, right? Mary, did you know? Yes, she knew. She knew. And so she says, if, if anybody can do something about this situation, he can. And so she goes up to the service and says, do whatever he tells you to do. Now, if I could boil down the essence of Christian discipleship to a few key phrases, I think this would be one of them. Do whatever he tells you to do. You want to find life? Do whatever Jesus tells you to do. 
How do you grow in your faith? Do and obey whatever Jesus tells you to do and obey. Now, as a Bible teacher, it's really tempting to think that the, the, the biggest problems that exist in our world is because of bad teaching. We simply need to straighten the, the record and, and teach people more effectively, and then the church would be in a lot better shape. Now, there is a lot of bad teaching that's out there. There's also a lot of good teaching that's out there. I mean, just go to YouTube. You'll see a plenty of both, right? But as much as teaching and good teaching is an issue, I think the biggest issue is actually one of obedience when it comes down to discipleship. It's not the things that are confusing that we don't fully understand in the Bible. It's the things that are unbelievably clear in the Bible that we don't do anything with. Oh, now I'm meddling. Those are the hard things, right? Love your neighbor as yourself. Pretty simple to understand the concept of that. Have you ever tried it? Put the needs of others ahead of yourself. Love other people in the way that you would want to be loved. Meet the needs of other people with the same tenacity and urgency with which you meet your own needs. Whew. Be free from the love of money. Forgive one another as you have been forgiven. Bear with one another out of reverence for Christ. Go and make disciples of all the nations of the earth. Very clear commands. No, it's not the unclear things in Scripture that are the biggest challenge, I think, in our discipleship. It's the things that are incredibly clear. And so how much does this phrase resonate with you? Do whatever he says. Do whatever he tells you to do. Guys, I feel like sometimes we are missing out on the incredible power of God in our life because we don't actually take, take him at his word in that. Step out. Do what he tells you to do and see God's power meet you there. What do they do? Verse 6. Now there are six stone water jars for, Jewish, for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to them, to the servants, fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the master of feast. So they took it. Do you have any idea how crazy that was? And how symbolic that was? Six stone water jars that were there for ceremonial washing and cleansing, each holding 20 to 30 gallons. Notice what he te doesn't tell them to do first. He doesn't say dump them out and refill them. Do you have any idea how grimy that water had to have been by this point? I mean, this was used for ceremonial washing. Now, if we were to travel from out of town and go to a wedding, we would probably check into our hotel or check, like, put our stuff where we were staying. A lot of us would probably take a shower, put our nice clothes on, right? But they didn't live in a time where there was plumbing, right? That, that took a lot of work. And so people traveling out of town, they would come and they would wash their hands. There was a whole elaborate system of ceremonial washing and purification where you would stick your arms into these jars up to about the elbows and you would clean them then. Notice that the party has probably been going on for a little while now because the wine is all gone. They planned it so that it would last, but it didn't last. And he says, fill those up, take a ladle and bring it to the master of ceremonies. Many commentators see in Jesus choosing these stone jars used for ceremonial purification something deeper and more profound. It was as if Jesus is saying right away, the ways of the old covenant with ceremonial washings are about to be superseded by something better. The cleansing of your uncleanliness that those things pointed to is going to be clarified and more fully fulfilled by Jesus and his cleansing blood. And the first sign here is pointing symbolically to our need for a cleansing that is to take place. See, in the Old Testament, there were all of these laws that reminded them that their sin separates them from a holy God. Sin leaves on us a stain, a sense of uncleanness, defilement, both in the wrong things that we do and the sin that has been done to us. When you really mess up, or when someone really hurts you, sometimes you feel the stain and defilement of sin deeply. That's why so many people take a shower. What Jesus does for us in the gospel is that he makes us clean. 
What these ceremonial purifications were pointing to is our deep need to be cleansed and washed and made holy and new. And those were certainly true realities, but Jesus comes and supersedes those things and through his precious blood cleanses us from sin so that we now no longer need ceremonial washing because we have been renewed and made clean by Jesus himself. The stain of sin has been removed. The defilement of sin has been taken away and in him we are holy and welcomed into the very presence of God. Some of you here this morning might need to not just hear that, but actually believe it and live like it's true and relate to God as if he has cleansed you and washed you and made you new and relate to yourself that you are no longer damaged goods, but one in which the son of God has died and cleansed, died for and cleansed. Oh, how different it would be if you actually believed that that's right here. That, that, that we're told over and over again that, that Jesus' blood cleanses us from our uncleanness and makes us new. And even in his first miracle, we see echoes of this longing and this need for us. Yet, we could focus too much here and lose the arc of the story, the narrative. Imagine this story from the perspective of one of the servants. Jesus doesn't say filter out the water or dump the water out and and refill them, but rather just fill them to the brim. Now, would you have had second second thoughts taking that to the master of the ceremonies? I know Mary said do whatever he did, and so there's like a little bit of deniability there for you. But would you scoop that water? It doesn't tell us when the water became wine. I think that the, the story is meant to hold that intention. It's not like wine glasses in their day were clear, and you could see they were in, in clay vessels. And so there's a, there's a huge act of faith here from the servants in bringing that to the master of the ceremonies, because if he drinks dirty ceremonial cleansing water, you might not get another job ever. Certainly your own reputation was at stake, and yet Jesus says, take it to him. And they do. Do whatever he tells you to do. I, I, I think there's a lesson here for us. Sometimes to see a miracle of God, we need to not only pray for it, but we need to step out when he tells us to step out. To do what he tells us to do. To go to that person and share with them. To go and ask if you could pray for them when God prompts you to do so. Do you go? Or do you stay? You may miss out on what God wants to do if when he prompts you to do it, you don't. In the same way, you might see more of the power and the love and the splendor of God if when his spirit prompts you to act and to speak and to step out, you actually do and God's power meets you there. Jesus often does miracles in the space where faith is required of us. Now, I'm not saying that Jesus wouldn't have done this, or he could have certainly taken out the the water as well and brought it to the master of the feast, but the the servants got to be part of that. And they they knew what went on, even though the master of the feast didn't went on, and you you better believe they're going to tell that to their kids and their grandkids, and if they're so blessed, their great-grandchildren. Let me tell you about a time that I saw the Messiah. The story continues, so they took it. When the master of the feast tasted the water now become wine and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. There you go. There's the story. The master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, everyone serves the good wine first. And when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. Everybody knows this, right? But you have kept the good wine until now. This is the best, the choicest wine. And then John writes, this is the first of his signs. Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory. And his disciples believed in him. They saw something here that pointed to something deeper. Now this is the part of the story that makes the Baptists in the room a little bit uncomfortable. The social drinking part where Jesus makes a whole lot of fine wine. Between 120 and 180 gallons worth well into the party. And not just the cheap stuff. The really good stuff. The master of the ceremony whose job is to keep the party going and to... to, to Enliven the group to, hey, check this out. Says, whoa, 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 you did it backwards. Like, 
You're supposed to serve the, the craft beer first and then the natty light. Or you're supposed to serve the choice wine and then the stuff that comes out of a box. This is the best. What are you doing? Some of you guys are like, my pastor knows about that stuff? I do, I do. I'm not under a rock. Here's the thing. The point of this story is not to be a commentary on social drinking, but it does teach us something about God and the goodness of his gifts. See, the, the Bible never condemns the drinking of alcohol as sin in itself. Otherwise, Jesus certainly wouldn't have provided this much wine. The Bible often sees it as it, and its use in celebration and even medicine as, to be a good gift from the Lord. However, the Bible does universally condemn drunkenness. That getting drunk is a sin. We are not to get drunk on wine, but rather as Christians, we are to be filled with and controlled by the Holy Spirit. Not by any substance, alcohol or another. But like all good gifts of God, alcohol can be abused, and when done so, the consequences are devastating, aren't they? If you have never talked with someone who grew up with a parent that was an alcoholic, you should. If you have never spoken with someone who the use and misuse of alcohol has devastated their life and train wrecked most of their relationships, you should probably do that to understand. But then again, you could probably say the same thing about food or sex or money. All things that are good gifts from God that when misused have devastating consequences. Some of you guys are like, yeah, but if you misuse food, like, that's a long-term thing. It doesn't impact your ability to, to, to make decisions. That's true. Some of these things are far more devastating than others. Like, it, it's a lot more devastating for you to, to try meth than to have a drink of wine. One is blatantly sinful. One is not. But both of them can impede your, can impede your judgment. Here's the thing. Some of you in this room have the conviction that as a Christian, you should never drink alcohol. Ever. And so this, this story of Jesus actually makes you a little bit uncomfortable. You struggle to have categories for it. But here's the thing. If that is your conviction, good. Don't drink. Don't violate your conscience. Where it becomes a problem for you is if you project your conscience on others and universally condemn alcohol that God has made and not called bad, but you call it bad. Some of you in this room can't handle alcohol responsibly. And if that's you, then you shouldn't drink either. It is far better for you to lay down a freedom than to have that freedom destroy you. Here's a thought for you to ponder, whether alcohol is a challenge for you or, or not. If you can't lay down a freedom, are you really free? The answer is no. That freedom has you actually in bondage. Others in this room can, can freely drink without struggle. So do so, but be wise. Enjoy the goodness of what God has made. But don't make it so front and center in your life that it constantly causes issues with you or other believers, perhaps to struggle or to fall into sin themselves. It is better for you to, to, to lay down your freedom than to flaunt your freedom in such a way that either destroys the community you're in or worse, causes someone in your community who struggles with that to fall into it again. So what's our position as a church on alcohol? Pastor, just, just give it to me straight. Here it is. One, don't be a legalist. Don't project your conscience on other people. Don't call sin what the Bible doesn't call sin. Second, don't be reckless. Don't get drunk. The Bible is clear on that. But also... Don't use alcohol as an attempt to deal with something else. You aren't going to find what you're looking for in that wine glass or at the bottom of that red solo cup. Many people use alcohol to medicate and to numb pain. That's when you know it's a problem. The same can be said for food. The same can be said for buying stuff. The same can be said for sex. It doesn't mean that we reject all of those things. But it does mean we need to be aware of what's going on in our heart. And so if we're turning to alcohol to fix something else in our life or to make it easier, stop. It's not going to work. 
In fact, it will lead to devastating consequences in your life. So don't be reckless. Don't be a legalist. Don't be reckless. Third, don't destroy others with freedom. If your drinking at a particular event is going to throw a nuclear bomb in the room, don't do it. It's not worth it. It's a freedom that can be laid down. Fourth, be wise and enjoy the goodness of what God has created. So, if it's a violation of your conscience, then don't do so. But don't project your conscience. Call this what I call personal legalisms. Just label them as what they are. It might be a boundary for you that you cannot cross. Good, that is wise. Just have the right category for it. It can't change your heart. So call it a personal legalism. But don't project it on everybody else. All right, that's not the point, but I thought that was important to talk about as we move into what we're going to talk about. Let's get back to the passage because there are some amazing things here. Why does Jesus respond to his mom? Woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. But then goes on to provide 120 to 180 gallons of wine to make this party epic. There are, and, and, and secondarily, why would this be his first sign about who he is? Because of two incredible gospel realities. The first, Jesus is the true wine that we long for. He is the Lord of the wine. Second, Jesus drinks the cup of God's wrath so that he can provide the cup of joy and feasting to all who come to him. Now that's going to take a little bit of explanation. Bear with me. First, Jesus is the true wine that we long for. He is the Lord of the wine. Do you know that deep down so many people reject Jesus because they think wrongly that if I come to Jesus, I won't have any fun? Does someone who doesn't want you to have any fun declare themselves to the world like this? Like, like you wouldn't verbalize that, but you say, if I follow Jesus wholeheartedly, what I'm going to have to give up on is what I really like. But if you see that that way, one, you don't understand Jesus, and two, you don't understand the compelling reality that he is what your heart longs after. He is the greatest wine. He brings the deepest joy. He is the real party. In, in the book of Proverbs, it says wine gladdens the heart. That's why it's often associated with feasting and celebration, because it has a way of amplifying, so to speak, wherever you're at. It's also why it's not a good thing to use to medicate your problems, because it amplifies where you're at. But Jesus says, I am the Lord of the wine. I am the true party. I am the one that you really long for. And if you think you know how to party, you haven't seen anything yet. <sighs> to not follow Jesus because you think you're going to miss out on life is like stopping at Taco Bell on the way to a steak restaurant, a steakhouse. Now, don't get me wrong, Taco Bell has its place. But not as an appetizer to that. All right, let me, let me show you this from Scripture. When the Old Testament points ahead to the redemption that God will bring about for his people, it is often pictured for us as a banquet or a feast of fine wine and rich food. Let me give you two examples. In Isaiah chapter 25, he says this, On this mountain the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food, full of marrow, of aged wine, well-refined. And he will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all peoples. The veil that is spread over all nations, he will swallow up death forever, and the Lord will wipe away tears from all faces. And the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. The redemption, the restoration that God will bring about as he wipes away the tears from our eyes is pictured as a, as a feast, as a party. One more promise from Amos chapter 9. Behold, the days are coming, verse 13, declares the Lord, when the plowman shall overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes who sows the seed. The mountains shall drip sweet wine and all the hills shall flow with it. I will restore the fortunes of my people Israel and they shall rebuild the ruined cities and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and drink their wine and they shall make gardens and eat their fruit. 
The, the redemption that the Lord brings about is a party. To enjoy the fruit of good labor and to feast and celebrate is the good life in almost every culture on this earth. And I think Jesus' first miracle, his first sign, is meant to evoke that longing in us for the real party, for the real joy, for the goodness of life. If we could but capture, if, if it wasn't so fleeting and sporadic, Jesus now brings the wine of gladness and feasting that points ahead to the party that will end all other parties. Now, why does Jesus say, my hour is not yet here? He's talking about the hour of his death. Now, single people in the room, when you go to a wedding, what do you inevitably begin to think about? Married people in the room, when you go to a wedding, what do you inevitably remember? Your wedding, right? Some single people are like, will I ever get married? What will that be like? What would it be like for me to take the part of the bride strolling down the aisle or the groom to just be dumbfounded by the, by the beauty of his bride? What would it be like for my family and friends to, to come around and celebrate with me? I don't think it's too far of a stretch to think that Jesus, in this moment at a wedding, is probably thinking about his own. But you're like, ah, oh, Pastor Kyle, Jesus never got married. He didn't on this earth. But the Bible, the scripture, is filled with allusions to his wedding. Do you want to know one? Revelations chapter 19, starting in verse 6. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, the roar, like the roar of many waters, and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder, crying out, Hallelujah! For the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. Let us rejoice and exalt and give him the glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come. The Lamb in Revelation is Jesus, and his bride has made herself ready. That's us. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. Guys, that is the party. That is the feast that you want to be invited to. If you think that Jesus came to stifle life and end the party, then you don't know Jesus. And you aren't reading his signs very well. Because his first sign declares himself to be the Lord of the feast. Additionally, in Revelation 21, we read this description of the heavenly city in Jerusalem. In verse 2, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And it goes on to describe it, and then it actually alludes back to Isaiah 25 about God himself wiping the tears from our eyes. For those of you who maybe are thinking, I'm reading too much into this story. Consider how the writer of John's gospel and the writer of Revelation is the same person. Consider why he declares this to be the very first sign in Jesus' ministry. What is that sign pointing to, if not God being the true husband to his people? Which is already a theme that's begun in the Old Testament and is now being brought to completion and fulfillment. Guys, this is the great hope for people. That every single wedding and marriage is to point to. See, God had declared himself to be the husband to his people. And even though his people Israel were unfaithful to him, now Jesus comes to make his bride pure and spotless and radiant. This is his first sign. The bride has made herself ready. She has been purified, washed of all of her blemishes. They've been covered. It's exactly what happens on a wedding day, isn't it? As the bride has all day, sometimes a week to prepare, I have, not, I have yet to see a bride who is not radiant when she walks down that aisle. And I get a great view of it. I get to be right next to the groom. I've done a lot of weddings. I have yet to see a bride who is not radiant. Now, if all of these things are true, and they are, why the hesitancy of Jesus to provide the wine? Why didn't he just freely do it? All right, here we go. Because he knew what it would cost him. My hour has not yet come. See, in the Old Testament, there was a cup of feasting and celebration, but there was another cup that was spoken of regularly. It was the cup of God's wrath. We read about it in Isaiah 51 and Jeremiah 25. Isaiah 51 says, wake yourself, wake yourself. Stand up, O Jerusalem. You who have drunk from the hand of the Lord, 
the cup of his wrath, who have drunk to the dregs the bowl, the cup of staggering. There is none to guide her among all the sons she has borne. There is none to take her by the hand among all the sons she has brought up. These two things have happened to you. Who will console you? Devastation and destruction, famine and sword. Who will comfort you? Your sons have fainted. They lie at the head of every street like an antelope in a net. What a vivid picture that is. They are full of the wrath of the Lord, the rebuke of your God. Therefore, hear this, you who are afflicted, who are drunk, but not with wine. Thus says the Lord your God, your God who pleads the cause of his people. Behold, I have taken away from your hand the cup of staggering, the bowl of my wrath you shall drink no more. Isaiah is speaking to the people who have been sent into exile, but now are being gathered back by God himself. And rather than continue drinking the wine of his wrath, he takes it away and says, you will not drink it anymore. Jeremiah 25. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, said to me, take from my hand this cup of the wine of wrath and make all the nations to whom I send you drink it. So this isn't just for his people. This is for all the people now. They shall drink and stagger and be crazed because of the sword that I am sending among them. And so we see that the the cup of the wrath and judgment of God is, is one being developed all throughout the biblical story. And it finds its climax in the Garden of Gethsemane when Jesus cries out in a prayer of utter desperation to his father. Father, if you are willing, remove this cup. From me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Why the hesitancy of Jesus to provide the wine? Because he knew what it would cost him to provide us the cup of feasting. It would mean that he would have to drink to the dregs the cup of God's wrath in our place to provide that cup of feasting. When Jesus says to his mother, My hour has not yet come. It is to that hour that he looks in the middle of this celebration, the hour of his death, the hour where the father turns his back on him, the hour where he becomes sin in our place so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Why did he do it? Why did he drink that cup? It's because he loves you. He loves you. And me. He loves you. What got him through the agony of that cup? Hebrews 12, 2 says, Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. He endured the shame of the cross, the scorn of the cross, for the joy that was set before him. And so we have to ask ourselves, what was that joy? Was it fellowship with the Father? No, I don't think so. He already had that. Was it it glory at the right hand of the Father? No, he had plenty of glory. The angels were worshiping and adoring him from eternity past, or from when he created them. What was it then? What was the joy that was set before him that willingly caused him to endure the scorn of the cross? Perhaps it could have been his purified bride and their wedding day. I think that's what it was. You and me, forgiven, purified, washed clean of our sins. Consider what it cost Jesus to provide the wine of feasting at this wedding. It set into motions events that would lead to his death and him drinking another cup. Jesus drank the cup of God's judgment and wrath so that he could offer to you today the cup of feasting. Amen? Three questions to ponder. First, have you put your faith and trust in Jesus today? Have you responded to his gracious, dare I say, proposal to you? Today can be the day. That you trust in him. That you realize, yes, you are dirty and defiled and separated from a holy God, but Jesus has come so that you could be washed and made new and brought near as a radiant bride. Now, guys... You might struggle to get your mind around this metaphor. You just got to deal with it, okay? Ladies are the sons of God, and you are the bride of Christ. We just all have to expand our mind here to get these metaphors. 
But is today the day where you say yes to Jesus and you respond to his gracious invitation? And if you're thinking in the back of your mind, if I come to him, will I lose all the fun? The answer is definitively no. You have no idea what fun is yet. Jesus says, I have come to give them life and life abundant. Second, do you believe then that he is the true joy and wine that your heart really longs for? That he came to bring life abundant and that in Jesus is the good life. And third, are you willing to do whatever he tells you to do? That you might see his power and experience his joy in a more profound way. Let's pray. God, thank you for your word, for how it provokes us and challenges us and stirs us. Thank you, Jesus, that you willingly drank the cup of God's wrath, that we might have the cup of feasting. We bless your name. We worship you. We stand in awe of you. And we thank you. Help us to do whatever you say, Jesus. In your name, amen. We're going to turn our attention to the communion table, which I would say is a reminder of the feast that is to come. The Apostle Paul, when writing to the Corinthian church, said this, For I received from the Lord what I delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. This meal calls us to look back, and it calls us to look forward. I'd like to maybe introduce you to the concept of looking at history through the lens of a wedding day. When Jesus came and he died on the cross, he was saying to you, he was declaring to those, his people, his bride, his vows. See, in a, in a wedding ceremony, there is the, the time of solemn vow making and then the crazy party afterwards. And on the day that you often feel the most amount of love for that other person, you bind yourself in crazy ways to them, don't you? I mean, think about the promises we make in sickness and in health for better or for worse, till death do us part. And we say that on the day that we feel so much love for them because the, there are days that we don't, that those vows hold us. Jesus, when he came and he died for his people, declared the full extent of his vows and his willingness to live and die for his people. And then... Before the party comes, he's taken away. He says to his disciples, I will not drink of the fruit of this vine until I drink it anew with you in the kingdom. And then he's taken away with the angels saying, he will come back in the same way. And so when we obey Jesus and we go to the communion table, we're to do this in remembrance of him, meaning we look back on his great love, his profound love to die for us and to make us clean. But there's also a sense of longing when we eat this meal that this is the merest of appetizers for the real party to come. And so Christian, I want you to experience both of those things when we take communion. You are remembering Jesus' body broken for you, his blood shed for you, but it is, it is filling you with a sense of longing like an appetizer does before the meal of the party to end all parties. When we get to eat this even greater meal again with Jesus in the kingdom. And so it should fill us with longing and faith and assurance of his love. If you're here this morning and you've put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus, then whether you're a member of this church or not, you are welcome at this table to remember his body broken for you and his blood shed for you. If you're here today and you're not a Christian, I wanted to let you know I'm really glad you're here. I have no desire to manipulate you into any kind of decision. And so if that's where you're at, I would just ask that you would remain in your seat and not participate in something that testifies to something you don't believe. However, if you're here today and something happened where you realize, I need Jesus to save me. And today you've believed in him. You've put your faith and trust in him alone to save you. Then I want to welcome you to come to this table for the first time in your life in faith. And remember his goodness, his body broken for you, his blood shed for you. And as you eat and as you drink and remember those things, I want this meal to fill you with a sense of longing for the party to end all parties.
Let me pray. God, I thank you for this meal that so tangibly illustrates and demonstrates for us these spiritual realities. As we eat and as we drink, would you satisfy our hunger and fill us with more for the day that we all long for? God, in the midst of our marriages or maybe upcoming marriages, would you allow us to yearn and long for the true marriage and relationship that these things merely point to? Would you satisfy us with your presence, Jesus, we pray in your name. Amen. If you'd come down the center aisle, grab a piece of bread and dip it in the cup and return down the side aisle as we sing, we'll celebrate communion together. Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid.
Father, we look forward to the day when we'll be entered in and presented as a bride beautiful and spotless without blemish by the blood of Jesus. Father, we look forward to living in your presence in joy, in fullness of joy. God, living out the wedding feast of the Lamb every day of our lives, being united with you fully. And we thank you, Jesus, that it's by your blood we get to experience that and look forward to that reality. And in your name we pray. Amen. Uh, you guys can have a seat. I've just got a couple announcements this morning. My name is Kelsey Oldenkamp. I'm one of the pastors here. And uh, the first announcement is foundations class. So if you've signed up for our foundations class, uh, we've got a change of location. It's actually going to be downstairs uh, today. So uh, foundations class at Rock Hill is part of our membership process. So if you are... Uh, have been coming to Rock Hill for a little while and are looking to uh, get connected and, and be committed to this being your church body, the, the Foundations class is the way uh, that you can do that. So we do that once a month, um, and our, the one today will be at 1215 downstairs. Second announcement is our member meeting. Uh, so all of our members, we try to get together three times a year. And so for our May meeting, uh, or our next meeting, our spring one, uh, we try to celebrate and look at all of the things that God is doing and God has done uh, in Rock Hill in the last year and look forward to uh, what he's going to do and what we can see uh, on the horizon. So our next member meeting will be June 2nd. Uh, after the second service here, it will be actually in Lincoln Park. Uh, we'll have some cookies and lemonade, some uh, light refreshments there. Uh, and yeah, it'll be a time to celebrate what God has been doing at Rock Hill and to, to look forward to uh, what he's going to be doing. Uh, also, VBS is coming up. So that will be uh, in June, I believe the last full week in June, whatever the dates are for that. I didn't write it down, which is on me. Um, but if you would like to volunteer for that, if you'd like to uh, help pull that off and make that happen, uh, volunteers, you can sign up using the link online. It's the same link for both signing up kids and volunteers. Um, so you can use that to get signed up. That's on our events page on the website or on the Church Center app. Uh, lastly, we will have a prayer team uh, available up here if there's anything that you would like prayer for. But Rock Hill, if you would stand with me. Uh, this morning, you are not dismissed, but you are sent to declare, display, and delight in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Have a great week.